Welcome to the Drunk Dietitians Podcast, co-hosted by your favorite tipsy registered dietitians, yours truly, Sammy Previtt, co-owner of Dietitians of Palm Valley, and Jenna Warner, owner of Happy Strong Healthy. Us dietitian besties can't stand diet culture bullshit and love keeping it real. Our mission is for all humans to believe that they are made for so much more than chasing a smaller body. We are also here to share with you that food can be fun and pleasurable again. Although we're medical professionals, we are human too. We are not afraid to share our deepest secrets and how years of our lives were taken by diet culture. We started this podcast so no human has to feel alone in their journey towards food freedom. So grab your favorite cocktail and join us for our favorite casual happy hour and expect to laugh, cry, learn, and grow. Cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Drunk Dietitians. If you guys are new here, we're so happy that you're here. I'm Sammy from Fine Food Freedom. And I'm Jenna from happystronghealthy.rd. And together we make up at Drunk Dietitians. If you're not already following us on Instagram, which we absolutely hope that you are, <laughs> please give us a follow because you'll see so much like behind the scenes info of all of these episodes. And lots of like the previews before they come out to get you super excited about them. Um, we like to do that in this intro each week before we get you into the episode to get excited, but you can get excited like the day before it gets out by following us on Instagram. Exactly. And then you get like some of the best quotes too from the episodes. And you'll also see these videos of us, which like we probably should start looking decent because we're usually just like, ah, screw it. It's just audio. But you're always wearing at least a nice shirt. Like today I put a little mascara on if I'm feeling it. <laughs> you're feeling inspiring it. me. Feeling good. <laughs> but today's episode was awesome. Yes. We had Dylan Murphy, registered dietitian in Nashville, but she's a, a virtual RD and specializes in eating disorder and I love 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 that we kind of hit on like eating disorder but then also the whole emotional eating component which I think everyone can relate with in 2020. In, in addition, you know, one of the best parts for me personally about the episode is she really dug into, the three of us did, you know, if you've ever said to yourself or heard in your head or heard somebody else say and you're questioning like intuitive eating doesn't work for me, we talk about that a lot. And, you know, I think it's super common if you don't really know what it is or if you're getting your information about intuitive eating from a fitness professional, perhaps. <laughs> um, a little plug Go for back and episode. listen. <laughs> yeah. Go listen. Listen to Jillian Michaels, episode 30 on our podcast. <laughs> but if you know, if that's what you know of intuitive eating, of course you're confused. So we really dug into that a little bit today as well, in addition to the other things Sammy mentioned. So it's an awesome, awesome episode, and I'm excited for you to hear it. Enjoy it. Welcome back, everyone, to Drunk Dietitians. We are so excited. We have such a fun topic to discuss today with Miss Dylan Murphy, our special guest. For those that don't know, Dylan Murphy is a registered dietitian and founder of the Free Method Nutrition, a virtual group nutrition practice that exists to equip women with the skills to overcome and the wisdom to move beyond the narratives of diet culture. Dylan is committed to helping women never diet again and overcome eating disorders by empowering them with the knowledge and skills to navigate food and body thoughts with confidence. And I'm laughing to myself because at first I called Dylan the author of the free method, <laughs> but that's coming maybe. Which maybe you just yeah, spoke that into the universe. So we're manifesting her book. <laughs> yes. After this. Um, but we're super excited to have you here, Dylan, and learn more about you and cover some really awesome intuitive eating topics today. Yes. Thanks for having me. I've been so looking forward to this conversation. I too. <laughs> yes. And for anyone, I don't know why I think this is so funny, but Dylan, <laughs> like direct message Jenna and I this morning, I was like, Hey, did you guys know you're like the top 10 nutrition podcasts on Apple podcasts? We think we don't know. Yeah. And like Dylan was the one who told us that. So what a, <laughs> what a great way. Life. Yes. Yeah. Shows how no, made me a little nervous. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to be on the top 10 podcast. <laughs> It's like, we should probably know these things, but like, 
who knows? Just goes to show yeah. you guys that we really are doing this because we love to do it and we want to give you value. And thank you for listening. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Yes, for sure. But so let's let's get started with a rapid fire so we can get to know you better, Dylan, and then we will jump oh, into all things. So Perfect. first things first, coffee or tea? Ooh, coffee, definitely. Coffee. Wine or beer? Wine. What kind sure. of wine? It depends on the season. So I'm a huge red wine girl, but recently in the summer, rosé. I really don't discriminate though. But I love white wine. Whatever anyone offers, I'm like, sure, I'll have some. <laughs> when, I <found> out, <laughs> when I found out I was pregnant, I literally the first thing I said to my husband was, I'm gonna miss rose season. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I do always okay. picture you with like a bottle of rose, Jenna. Oh, like, so <laughs> that makes sense. My pacifier. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, all right, we got vodka or tequila. Tequila, definitely. Margaritas all day. <laughs> Are you like a tequila snob? Like, do you have a favorite tequila or you're just like any tequila? So definitely the like 100% blue agave tequila. So like the white te or clear tequila or whatever. But I'm more of a margarita snob. Like I right. like like the fresh homemade margaritas versus like, like I guess the, the thick non juice that they like yes. pour in. This is like margarita yeah. mix, and it's like yeah. I'm, like, mm -mm. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with yeah. you. All right. While we're on the margarita topic, crunchy yeah. or soft shell taco? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, soft shell. Okay. Um, Netflix and chill or night out on in the town? Uh, I feel like a little bit of both. Like I would like a night out on the town, and then to come back. And Netflix and chill. <laughs> Perfect. <So best. laughs> yeah. Best Sounds like to a both great night. <laughs> yes, uh, for sure. All right. I know, it depends on my mood. <laughs> yes, totally agree. Um, this this is our big one. If you've listened before, you know this. Um, you might know whose team you're going to side with. Oh, yes. <laughs> Crunchy or smooth peanut butter? Smooth. I have it every yes. morning. Wow. All right. That's okay. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay I feel like our guests get like scared by this question because they're like, is Sammy going to like me or is Jenna yeah. going to like me? So team uh, Sammy today. Yes. Uh, perfect. And last but not least, um, if you could have one thing in your life in limitless quantities, but it cannot be money, what mm -hmm. would it be and why? Yes, I've thought about this one too because I've listened to y'all's podcast. Um, <laughs> definitely queso. So not a very serious answer. <laughs> but I, oh gosh, Siri is going off. Did y'all just hear that? Siri just went no. off. No. Okay. <laughs> she just likes queso too, I guess. Yes. <laughs> like, where but, would you like yes. it delivered from? Dad? Yes. I'm like, yeah. please bring me queso. So if there's queso on my doorstep when we finish, my life will be complete. I would love to Perfect. see that picture. <laughs> yes. I feel like so many of our guests have been like margarita, taco, queso, mm -hmm. like fans. Like we might just yes. need to like have a party or something. I know. And oh my God. I... When we hit a hundred thousand downloads, let's have a taco yes. and peanut butter party. <laughs> yes. I'm into it. That might yes. be soon. Who knows? Right? Uh, Who knows? And I'm sitting here laughing. I feel like Dylan, this is how you and I connected, but you <laughs> have posted some of the funniest like pop culture memes ever. I'm looking at your Instagram on here. Yes. There's one that just like kills me. The one of somebody taking out the trash and it says diet culture <laughs> on it. It's just so funny. Yes. I love to see that. Um, and I think that's a really great segue into just tell us more about you. Um, yeah. how you got started as a dietitian in the anti-diet space. Mm -hmm. Was it always this way? Um, anything else about your passion for these funny memes? The Drake one's pretty <laughs> funny too. Like I'm dying. Yes. Over here. <laughs> uh, I love a good pop culture reference and I feel like <laughs> memes help people like it gets a point across in like a approachable way. Mm -hmm. Love a good meme. But yeah, I, I feel like I got into just my work as a dietitian very similar to other people. We're more so from the route of just like obsession with food, calorie counting. I played a lot of sports growing up and so was very much into like how food fuels your performance. And from there led me to just like Googling nutrition stuff all the time and we know how Google can <laughs> tell us a lot of misinformation about nutrition. And so I think when I first was like, okay, I want to become a dietitian, it was more so rooted in like, I want to help everyone be healthy. I'm going to help people lose weight. Everyone like, it's going to be great. We're going to do meal plans, all these things. And 
then I think fast forward to like when I was wanting to start my business, I met with a lot of dietitians in Nashville, just like networking, hearing how they got started, all of that. And that's actually how I learned about intuitive eating and haze, which is crazy. Like I didn't learn that in school, um, which I think is very common for a lot of dietitians as well. And so the more, yeah, the more <laughs> I learned about that, I was like, this is like what I need to be doing because I, and I think that was when I also was able to like fully connect the dots of okay, all this like calorie counting that I spent so much time doing and juice cleanses and diets and this like orthorexia, like obsession with food was not fulfilling and was not like living and it wasn't sustainable. And so when I learned like, oh, there's something that's like literally the polar opposite of this, I want to be like, I'm on that team. And so from there, it really expanded into like, now I work a lot, probably like 70% of my caseload are people who have active eating disorders. So I work mostly with clients who have active eating disorders and then kind of help them transition into more of that like intuitive eating space once that, once we're ready for that. Um, so yeah, I feel like I almost like fell into my lap, but in the sense of like, okay, this makes so much sense because I can relate to this from my own personal story. Um, but I think if you would have asked me back in college when I first had the thoughts of like, I want to start my own practice. And even in my internship, it would have been more so like, yeah, I want to help people lose weight and all of that. So really when like starting my business, I think I had that like come to Jesus moment in a sense where I like knew weight loss wasn't the answer. So I think that helped me never like my business never really went through the transformation because i feel like i went through the transformation before starting my business and so must I think be covered... nice <laughs> damn <laughs> oh, i am so oh. envious but but i yes. think publicly failing not failing publicly yeah. changing can be yeah. helpful but good for you that you got to be firmly rooted you're like a clear tuning to us we're like uh -huh. you uh, yes rooted yes. in it which is awesome yeah so rare so, you two are like yeah. unicorns yes <laughs> <laughs> i know and i don't i think I mean, part of it, maybe like the community of dietitians in Nashville is very big and very different, I think, than a lot of cities. And so I think that really helped a lot where we have a bunch of like networking meetings and events and like lunch and learns and all this stuff that really helped expose me when I was in those early stages of like, I want to start a business, but I'm trying to figure this out. So and I, I mean, I do. Th I mean, I think I still like learned a lot in the early stages of like, how do I more so I think with like the whole weight piece of like, okay, how do I ex like, I knew I believed that, but then it was also learning like, how do I explain this to people? And I think that's where like digging into more of like intuitive eating and reading more and all that sort of stuff. Cause it's literally the opposite of what we learn in school. Yeah. Like we learn how to give people eating disorders in school. And so now we have to learn. <laughs> that's what I always tell my clients. I'm like, we I love like, that. We need to uh, call, uh, caption that for this I mean, episode. Yeah. <laughs> Dietitians are taught how to give eating yes. disorders. Uh, it's, when do you yeah. think the academy will catch on? Like hopefully mm. soon. <laughs> yeah. But wait, I really have a burning question. So, mm -hmm. so you you kind of discovered this, and you're like, okay, yes, like this is what I need to do. So, how did you go from that to I want to work with eating disorder? Because for anyone listening, if mm -hmm. you have an active eating disorder, which I know Dylan can go more in depth. Like going right mm -hmm. into intuitive eating can be dangerous. Yes. So, how did yes. you say like, okay, I want to like get them to the transition, but first work mm -hmm. with the actual eating disorder. Yeah, I think it really, so Nashville, there's three big colleges here in Nashville. One is Vanderbilt, which is a very mm -hmm. like high achieving college and with high achieving, high status, also eating disorders kind of flow with that naturally. And so Nashville, I just, there was a really big need for practitioners in the eating disorder space. And I okay. think as I was doing more like marketing and posting more on Instagram and like all of that, I just realized a lot of the people that were reaching out to me actually had active eating disorders. And so it almost, and it sounds like I didn't, I don't, it almost like fell into my lap in a sense, which is kind of a weird way to say it, but it kind of just like, I just started getting clients who were actively struggling with eating disorders. And so 
from there, I started getting supervision from dietitians who like are certified eating disorder dietitians just to learn more and got really, really passionate about that. And because like what you just mentioned about intuitive eating, I also see a lot of clients come to me who are like, I've tried intuitive eating and it didn't work for me. And so I think, and because of that, it's like, they're still in like the deep, deep pit of their eating disorder. And so I feel like I've also been able to provide clients a lot of freedom in knowing like, okay, it's not that you failed intuitive eating, but right now you can't eat intuitively because you're so trapped in all these eating disorder thoughts and your hunger and fullness cues aren't even mm -hmm. like showing up. So you, and that's like foundational of intuitive eating. Like you can't even, you don't even know what honoring your hunger looks like or feeling your fullness or all of those different things. And so I think I just saw a big need there for that. And it just, I think resonated a lot with like my personal story where I never had a full on eating disorder, but more so like can for sure relate to that, like high achieving, like wanting to be the best and wanting to be like, quote unquote, perfect of like, okay, I want, like I mentioned queso earlier and I can remember in high school, I like wouldn't touch queso and it's like literally my favorite food. I was like, no, I can't eat queso. It's like processed. It's all this. I need to eat a salad instead. And so I think from those experiences and then seeing people coming into my office with very similar stories, either on the restriction side or like the binge eating side, I think it just kind of felt like a natural fit for me. Um, and then I also enjoyed the other aspect of people who are on more of the recovery side who are like, okay, now how can I make, like, how can I create a healthy relationship with food? What does that look like? How can I make this like a sustainable lifelong journey? Yeah. I don't want to go too deep in a hole, but I have so many questions I'm writing down here. <laughs> Only because I realized when we had um, the Eat Cake podcast ladies on, mm -hmm. they are certified in eating disorder um, uh -huh. um, as dietitians. And mm -hmm. I think you might be, well, we do have an episode with Anna Sweeney that will be released, but I would just love mm -hmm. if you could share with anyone listening who might think they have an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And if you could just kind of talk about like, what is atypical anorexia, mm -hmm. even though I hate that term. Mm -hmm. And um, if someone thinks they have an eating disorder, but then they say, but I'm not um, mm -hmm. thin, like I'm not thin enough to eating have an eating disorder. How would you yeah. respond to that? Yeah, so I think the first thing is eating disorders do not have a look. And if you, I mean, if you watch TV, if you see movies, if you go on social media, you would think the opposite. You would think, oh, I don't have an eating disorder unless I'm like 70 pounds and need to be hospitalized, where that's more so like, yeah, that's an eating disorder, but that's kind of like the worst case scenario where most people in our society that struggle with eating disorders are very like, and I hate even saying like average look, but all shapes and sizes. Yeah. And so... And I, I see that with a lot of my clients where a lot of them have, it's taken them a while to reach out because of that mindset of I'm not sick enough, I'm not thin enough. Or when they hear eating disorder, they think like, okay, well, I'm not purging or I'm not engaging in these like major, major behaviors. So I don't have an eating disorder, like I'm fine. But then one thing leads to another and then two years down the road, they realize things have gotten worse. So one thing that's what i would say eating disorders do not have a look um and really if you have if you're not able to eat food without feeling guilt if you're worried about okay if i eat this then i'm gonna gain all this weight and my weight is how i like is attached to my worth and my status and mm -hmm. if there's just a lot of fear around food for you and then you notice that continuing to develop of okay, now I won't even eat processed food. I have to make all my food homemade. And that's kind of how eating disorders, I see at least with a lot of my clients where it, they kind of, I mean, they're very sneaky where it starts out of like, I'm just wanting to prioritize my health and be healthy. And so I'm gonna stop eating sugar. And then that just spirals into one thing after another. Um, or on the other end of the spectrum where I'm struggling so much with emotions and I don't know how to navigate them without food. And so I'm just binge eating all the time. And now I feel like I'm stuck in this hamster wheel that I can't get out of. And so really with that, then it's realizing, I mean, reaching out for help is one of the hardest things that someone can do. 
And that's like the first thing I tell all of my clients when we hop on a discovery call to chat about services is like, I first want to like applaud you for reaching out because this is not easy in our society. I mean, diet culture thrives off of giving people eating disorders again. And so to realize what I'm doing is wrong or not supporting my body and then to step out and want to do something different is huge. And it's so hard because a lot of my clients with eating disorders, especially if it's more on the like anorexia side and anorexia, like you mentioned with atypical anorexia, does not have a look. You could be any shape, size, body and have anorexia. And that's more the point where you're maybe losing your period. Your body can't regulate temperature anymore. You, your brain, you can't really even think rationally. And so stepping out to get treatment is, it's almost, I compare it with my clients of having like an angel and a devil on your shoulder where you know, like, okay, the devil being your eating disorder is like, don't get help. You don't need help. You're not sick enough. Just trust me. I got you. The angel being like that voice of freedom, knowing like, no, there's more to life than having an eating disorder. And a lot of clients are still in that middle road when they reach out for help. And a lot of times throughout the a good year of us working together, it's still that tug of war of like, okay, one day I want to choose recovery and the next day I want to choose my eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So all of that being said, I feel like a big thing I would also tell people is don't feel like you have to be hundred percent ready to give up your eating disorder in order to reach out for help either because that's a huge role that the dietitian and the therapist and the other providers in the whole support system play is helping you start to realize more that like an eating disorder is way way better than like an eating disorder yeah that was such a good answer <laughs> yeah um and it's one of those things i just could talk forever I love that. And I think I've recently heard more often the discussion about bulimia and exercise mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and how people never really realize that that can be a form of bulimia. I had a conversation with someone yeah. very recently about that with, you know, just the understanding that that is a form of purging as well. Mm -hmm. And that when we talk about analyzing our relationship with fitness, you know, mm -hmm. that's a big one. Do you see that a lot as well? Yeah, yeah. Because people, when you think bulimia, you immediately think purging in the sense of throwing up. But, and that is the most common form, but also using laxatives, that's a form of purging. Mm. Um, exercise, that's a form of purging. And so anything where it's like, I eat and I have to get this out of my body, I need to just, I have this energy that I need to release. And, and a lot of times that also goes hand in hand with more of the like emotion side of it and like distress tolerance work of uh, yeah that can be such a hard thing of clients getting in the moment of like I feel like I need to purge and I need to either run or take laxatives or do these different behaviors but I don't want to do them but I don't know what else to do instead mm -hmm. and and yeah I feel like that's one thing that's not as talked about as much versus purging and thinking immediately throwing up yeah. So one thing you had, you would kind of went into a little bit previously was talking about that like emotional side of eating and, and that binging that we know mm -hmm. us three comes from that, you know, that restriction. So when yeah. someone comes to you, let's, let's maybe shift gears a little bit. Let's say maybe someone's mm -hmm. not clinically diagnosed with an eating disorder, or, yeah. but they've dieted for 10 20 years that on and off diet roller coaster. Um, and they come to you and they say, I'm an emotional eater. Like where, where do you start with them? Yeah. So really with that, one thing that I like to start with first is digging into food fears with clients and seeing food fears, food rules, food rituals, and seeing like, what foods are you restricting? And uh, so then we can kind of see like, okay, so you, I see you don't keep ice cream at home. And then you mention anytime you eat ice cream, you overeat it, emotionally eat it that kind of makes sense because it's off limits. And then when you have it, like that binge restrict cycle we talk about where, okay, ice cream's been off limits. Now you're eating it. Here comes the guilt and the shame. You're doing this bad thing. So you might as well just keep doing it. And then the diet will start tomorrow. And so that, and that can be very like freeing for clients to hear that of like, oh, that makes sense why I can't stop eating ice cream or whatever the food may be. And so 
one, we talk about that. Another thing I do with clients, because what I see with emotional eating too, is when you think about emotions and you think about being sad versus being angry, what you're going to do when you're sad to cope with that emotion is going to be different than what you're going to do when you're angry to cope with that emotion. Cause they're two different emotions. You may need two different things. And so we also spend time writing out what are the core emotions that you typically feel? And most humans, we feel sad, we feel shame, we feel happy, we feel angry, all these different emotions. And then we take time digging into, okay, how can you best serve and honor yourself when those different emotions come up? Sadness, anger, et cetera. And all throughout this conversation, it's also reinforcing like, Food is going to be one of those. In every single emotion, food is going to be used when you're sad, when you're angry, whatever the emotion may be. So we're not saying emotional eating is bad. What we're wanting to do is help add more tools to your toolbox. So then you can see when I feel sad because I, because we're in 2020 and life is really hard <laughs> and I feel really sad and maybe I know that food is not what's going to help me right now. Maybe I have an awareness of my emotions where I know food isn't what I need. Then you can have other options in your toolbox to know, okay, well also if I journal or if I meditate or if I call my best friend, those are also things that help me when I feel sad. And so that's a big thing I spend time doing with clients because I think with emotional eating, if we don't address like the actual one, I think it's helping clients understand and have an awareness of what emotions they're feeling. Because what I see a lot with clients is it's so easy to like disassociate or not feel their emotions, just feel kind of numb of knowing like, okay, I just ate a whole pizza. I don't really know why I did, but I just, it was kind of on autopilot. I just, next thing I know, the pizza box is empty. And so another big thing is really bringing in like, okay, how can we like pause, slow down, like, see what's going on, see what's going to be the best tool for the job is eating pizza or do we maybe need to do something else for 15 minutes or so, revisit the pizza, do you still want it and kind of go from there. And one thing I didn't mention too with emotional eating that I always tell clients is, and I have a graphic I always show them too, is with emotional eating, like the very first question you should ask yourself if you're trying to like figure out like, is this emotional eating? Should I eat right now? What do I need to do? Is asking yourself, am I hungry? Because if you're hungry, the answer is always you need to eat food. And maybe there's other things you need to do because maybe you also need to kind of tap deeper into that like sadness or anger or whatever the emotion may be, but you need to eat if you're hungry. And then if you're not hungry, then we maybe take it a few steps further of like, do you think food is going to be the best tool for the job here? If yes, then eat. If no, then let's explore the other ideas that we figured out together. And sometimes that's trial and error because clients sometimes have gotten so deep in that emotional eating kind of spiral where they don't even know other things that can help with their emotions. So some of it's brainstorming like, well, what are things you like to do for fun? Or if you're feeling sad or if, if your best friend was feeling sad, how would you tell her to comfort herself? And let's try some of those things for you too. So I feel like there's emotional eating is almost like peeling back layers of an onion where it's like, okay, let's see if this is going to work. And then if this is going to work and, and it's been a big thing I've seen in 2020 for sure with, I mean, there's just, I feel like everyone's feeling like a million emotions all at once. So it's like, how do we navigate all of this with food, without food, all of that. That was so wonderfully explained because I love the part. It's I think it's so, so important to talk about, like, first of all, are you hungry? Because <laughs> I think so many yeah. people think they're emotional eaters because when they're eating, they're also feeling emotions. But, like, mm -hmm. if you're hungry and stressed or if you're hungry and happy or if you're hungry and sad, yes. you're hungry. <laughs> like, <laughs> but you're also feeling you emotions. And so... Yes. I find so, so many with so my group coaching, like they'll come, they'll all come and say, I'm an emotional eater. And then by the end of the six weeks, they're like, shit, I was just hungry. Yeah. And, and I feel emotions, <laughs> right? Like, yes. and shit, so I'm they're, human. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there's definitely like, there are definitely people that are emotional eaters, like, you know, using air quotes that would term themselves that way. Mm -hmm. But I think more often than not, people find they're just hungry. But then mm -hmm. again, you did such a beautiful job of if, if you rule out hunger, 
are and you're still using food to cope, it's okay. And I think yeah. people need that permission because once mm. we know that we're allowed to do it, it's like, oh, oh yes. okay, I don't want to do it anymore. What else can I do? Yeah. To feel good. Yeah. So like take some of the appeal away. And I think a big thing too is, and something I always remind my clients is knowing even when you recognize like, okay, I think I'm using food all the time where I maybe you need to use other things too. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're going to become just like a master at intuitive eating and a master at knowing like, should I eat? Should I do something else? Like it takes time and there you learn from the times where maybe you feel like you messed up, even though it wasn't a mess up, but you learn from that. And so I think that's also really important for people to know is like, it's not like you immediately, everything's just fixed overnight also. I think it's so interesting and on par with the switch in the fourth edition of the book um, mm -hmm. of intuitive eating, mm -hmm. because I think you guys mentioned before we started recording that the first three editions, the principle, principle seven was cope with your emotions without food. Is that mm -hmm. what it stated? Um, mm -hmm. And now they've changed it to cope with, cope with your emotions with kindness. And it's so on par with mm -hmm. what you just said, because you can cope with your emotions with food and also yeah. alternatives. And I think that's huge. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, like that's we so would right. all be lying if we didn't like go through a breakup and eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's. Oh my gosh! Like, yeah, that's yeah. like a, a, a rite of passage <laughs> of like being yes. a woman or a human going through a breakup. So yeah. um, maybe it is just me, but but no, I think no. I'm <laughs> definitely married. For anybody yeah. listening, like, why am I talking about a breakup? But I think you know what it is i'm in my room at home in pittsburgh where i grew up so there's like oh, all these little things that you like get like yes. transplanted or transported back into time and like relive mm -hmm. things so oh yeah i'm just gonna make this a therapy session while I'm at it. <laughs> i think you know that's a big that's a great point jenna and i think and i know elise mm -hmm. and evelyn the authors of intuitive eating talk about all of these changes and they just like us as dietitians talk about how like they make mistakes, they're learning, they're growing, the research is changing, the principles are changing, and that's such an important point. Yeah. One of the things that you had mentioned, Dylan, before we dove into this topic, which was amazing, that I just, it's on my question list, <laughs> so I want to <laughs> ask it, is you mentioned where you hear from clients that intuitive eating didn't work for me, and mm. I have heard that more times more recently than I ever have. And I just, I think it can come from so many different spaces. But mm -hmm. if you were talking to a client specifically that said that to you, what mm -hmm. would you say to them? How would you combat, you know, a statement like that? Because again, yeah. I know, and I've listened to a podcast where Elise kind of answered that question as well. Um, and it was fascinating to hear her mm. response. And I think we all would answer very similarly, but I would love to know how you would yeah. speak to somebody like that. Those are sometimes some of my favorite clients. Cause I just love the, it's, a, I feel like it almost feels like a challenge of like, <laughs> I'm going to prove you wrong. <laughs> like just wait. And I mean, there's several facets to that where if clients have tried intuitive eating from more of just like the diet culture lens. And I think diet culture has gotten their hands on intuitive eating and like tried to manip yes. <laughs> and try to manipulate it into like lose weight while eating intuitively and that sort of language, then it's not going to work for them because intuitive eating is not a weight loss diet. And also you can't eat intu intuitively and count calories or count macros or be actively pursuing intentional weight loss. And so I see it from that vantage point where then I have to kind of almost re-explain to clients how, what intuitive eating is and what intuitive, what intuitive eating is not, where we don't focus on weight loss. We focus on behavior changes and how can you respect your body and how can you listen to your hunger, listen to your fullness, like move your body in a way that you enjoy and all of these different factors. Um, and a, I mean, a lot of times people are very hesitant because I think also in admitting that intuitive eating didn't work for them and then reaching out to a practitioner like one of us, they're also realizing like, so maybe this whole intentional weight loss thing is also not working for me. And, and so some of it is also with clients like that, a lot of just validating, like, you're not the problem. Diet culture is like diets are set up to fail us, like two thirds of people gain back more weight than they were at when they started. And so 
when you're starting a diet and even though they may not know that necessarily and if so if you're doing intuitive eating from the lens of a diet it's not going to work um so yeah so that's a big piece is helping basically just reframe what intuitive eating is and then also help them which this takes a lot of time but help them really separate their weight from their worth and their weight from their values so then they can see okay intuitive eating actually has nothing to do with my weight and what would life look like if i didn't care about the size of my body and i know that i could still take care of it and nourish it and move it and do all these great things for it but not coming from a place of how can i lose weight how can i be small how can i eat x amount of calories a day and that's hard for clients to do so yeah that's i feel like a really really big thing and then i mean kind of with the side of my like eating disorder clients which is kind of a similar mindset as well where they're not in touch with their hunger and fullness cues and so intuitive eating really with because uh, i have clients reach out to me all the time who are even like so ready to move forward and recover from their eating disorder and i i don't let them read the book they'll ask me like can i start reading intuitive eating and like no because you're not at a place right now where you can read it and see it from like a non-diet lens like you're going to read it through the lenses of your eating disorder or you're going to read it through the lenses of your diet and so that's just going to take you steps further away and i think that's where people get fearful of intuitive eating and and then i think there's also the layer of helping them understand like intuitive eating is also not just eating ice cream all day every day and eating pizza all day every day and so i think sometimes clients literally they like jump into intuitive eating and they only focus on like okay so this means i have unconditional permission to eat so i'm just gonna eat like crazy and just no just kind of all things all rules out the window which yes all rules out the window but i think that's a big piece where they're like okay well so they're not now eating pizza all the time and my stomach is hurting all the time and i i'm noticing my mental health and i'm feeling stressed and so i think that's a piece too where they're looking they're not seeing the whole picture they're looking at like part of intuitive eating without like fully understanding what it is like jillian yeah. Michaels. I'm like thinking of her the whole time I'm saying all that. I was like, that's so similar to what we just released today. Yeah. About the if, you have it, if you haven't listened to that episode, yes. yes. Well, dear Jillian Michaels, yeah. and it must be uh, you. <laughs> yes. yes. But no, I think that's such an important point because I think that's where like on social media, oh. the mm -hmm. most a misunderstood thing is that I think people think intuitive eating is the unconditional permission to eat, which is, but then they mm -hmm. think that means we're promoting pizza, cake, cookies, ice cream all day long, every day. But it's interesting if for anyone who hasn't, if you Google stages of intuitive eating, it'll come right up. These are defined like evidence-based stages that in stage two, you start to find that you are eating more like, you know, indulgent, sugary, you know, these foods that have been restricted for so long. And that's like a normal part of it. But if you're not doing this with a professional, if you're not doing this with support, I think exactly like you said, they get to that part and they're actually like on the journey correctly, but then they yes. like freak out because they're, yes. they don't know how to navigate away from that. And mm -hmm. so um, that's such a good yeah. point. Yeah, because yeah, if you've been oh, restricting some, like if you've been avoiding ice cream for so long, of course, when you reintroduce ice cream, you're going to eat it more than you normally have because it's like new shiny that sort of thing but then over the course of time then it'll just become like any other food where some days you'll eat ice cream and some days you won't but yeah that i feel like that can be the most unsettling part for clients which is where the dietitian comes in hand so much to be like yes. this is normal and you're going to be okay the conversation I heard with Elise Resch, where she said, I just want everyone to know something along these lines, that this is not like an only donut diet. <laughs> <Because> yes. She's <laughs> like, if you go on the hashtag intuitive eating on Instagram, oh, yeah. you see a bunch of people eating donuts. <laughs> I thought that was funny because, you know, yes. it, that's like one of the top demonized foods, right? So, of mm -hmm. course, professionals want you to know that you can have that. Um, mm -hmm. But I loved the way that she put that in addition to what you just said, like, it's also about deciding when you want the salad and when you want mm -hmm. the pizza and making those choices. I think that's huge. Yeah. 
Because then also you're, when you're saying yes to the salad or to whatever the more nutrient dense food may be, your yes is rooted in truly wanting it versus feeling like you have to have it. And that's, that's even how I describe food freedom, food freedom to clients is like when you're saying yes to a salad because you want it, not because you're on this diet or because you ate five donuts last night and you have to have it to make up for it. Like that's when you're actually able to enjoy the nutrient dense foods too, because it's like, oh, I can't wait to have the salad because I'm just craving a salad. And then I can't wait to have this pizza tomorrow night because I'm craving pizza. Like it just makes food neutral. Yeah. That's it's like a nice like way to mic drop right there. Like. <laughs> so we always we always do our nutrition tipsy of the episode. So regarding, mm -hmm. I know we covered so many different facets between eating disorders, emotional eating, but if you could leave listeners with like one big takeaway, it could be anything, what would you want them mm -hmm. to leave this episode with? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm like, what what tip should I say? <laughs> um so I think one thing kind of bringing it even all together is knowing that intuitive eating is possible for everyone. Because I think even in talking about how I see people come to me and my clients who are struggling with active eating disorders, where there may be stages in your life where you're not ready for intuitive eating, but it is so possible for everyone. And it's so much more freeing than diets or anything else that someone's tried. And I think even a big thing on that note too, is I know, and I see this with clients all the time, there's a lot of fear in letting go of that control of tracking your weight every day, counting your calories, of having that sense of control, but in letting go of that and just letting your body actually be wherever it's meant to settle, whether that's higher than where you are now, lower, the same, whatever it may be, your life is going to be so much more fulfilling at that point than it ever has been on a diet in your whole entire life. And sometimes it takes getting to that point to actually believe it. Cause, and I, I tell my clients that all the time. I'm like, I know what I'm saying probably sounds like insanity. And you're like, that's not true. I'm like, just like, trust me. Even if you just like 1% <laughs> trust me, just trust me because I promise you there will be a time where you're eating intuitively and you're able to say yes to the salad or say yes to the pizza or whatever it may be. And you're able to think about other things than food because life is more than just what we put in our body and how we move in our, move in our body. So yeah, that's probably like the big tip and takeaway that I hope people would hear from all this. Yeah, that's perfect. That. Tell everyone where they can find you. Yeah. So on Instagram, I'm at dylanmurphy.rd and my website is freemethodnutrition.com. And I also have a podcast. So if they go to, well, freemethodnutrition.com slash podcast or just search food freedom podcast on anywhere you listen to podcasts, they can listen to that as well. Amazing. Perfect. Thank you so much for being yes. here today. This is yes. so great. Time just flew by. I can't I know. Uh, when you're saying that, I was like, whoa, how is it? <laughs> We've already finished talking. <laughs> yes, that was so fast. Thank you so um, much. Yes, thank you. Guys, thank you so much for listening and being here with us. I am virtually cheersing all of you. We absolutely love sipping on a cocktail with you and sharing as many nutrition tipsies as possible during this episode. We know there are a ton of pods out there and we are so appreciative of your time that you spent listening to us today. Please be sure to check out the show notes for episode details and all of our guest information. We promise to keep bringing you the best and the most knowledgeable and fun guests we possibly can. Please be sure to subscribe, like, share, and post if you enjoyed our content today. And visit us on Instagram and Facebook at Drunk Dietitians to find out what is up next for us on the pod. We absolutely love you. We appreciate you and can't wait to spend more time cheersing with you soon.